everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite and I will be hanging out with you today as we near the end of our series on plants. Topic for the day is going to be response to the environment. Now we had a whole video on response to light. Obviously it's a big deal in the life of a plant. Today we're talking about specifically plants response to the environment. So let me go ahead and get you your objectives and we'll get going for the day. There's just one thing that I need you to know or be able to do by the end of our video. Describe multiple plant responses to changes in the external environment. So first topic, first important thing is why do plants need to respond at all? Well, it's kind of tough to be a plant. If you think about animals, animals can move, they can get warmer, they can get cooler, they can grow fur, they can chase food. It's easier to survive in a changing environment if you're able to move around and do those things. Plants are stuck where they are. So if the environment around them changes, that makes their life tough because they can't just get up and move somewhere else. And think about the other challenges they got to face. Let's say a seed falls and lands in the wrong direction. It can't just flip itself over so that it's positioned correctly to grow into the soil. So the rest of this video is going to focus on specific things that plants do to cope with the environment that's around them. Probably one of the biggest factors that plants need to cope with other than light is gravity. If you think about plants, plants grow straight up and down. Roots go down into the soil, stems and shoots go straight up, and you know, that's the way that plants need to be oriented so that they have everything that they need. So they get the sun that they need so that they can grow down into the soil to get the water that they need. So a response to gravity is known as a gravitropism. A tropism is just a response. And a lot of experiments have been done with plants and you know, most of them are something like this. You lay a plant sideways, see what happens. And you can do this with your plants at home. If you've got a house plant, you can lay it over sideways, and eventually the stem will turn and it'll start growing upwards and it'll have a curve in its stem. Um, one of the ways that plants exhibit gravitropism is through these things called statoliths. Inside the cells of many plants are organelles that have got a lot of starch granules in them, which makes them heavy. Those are called statoliths, and they respond to gravity by settling to the bottom of a cell. And the plant will respond by growing in the direction that those statoliths have settled. So let's say you take a plant, set it on, set it on its side, so the cell is now like this. All those statoliths will settle to the bottom down here, and in turn the plant stem will curve and grow up. Um, a posigrap positive gravitropism is exhibited by growth downwards towards gravity. Roots obviously exhibit positive gravitropism. Negative gravitropism is growing against gravity and that would be the rest of the plant growing straight up. Next response for you to know about is to touch. This is a figmotropism and it responds to something touching the plant. Um, it's been well shown that just even briefly touching a plant can stunt its growth significantly. Now in some areas that say have got high wind this is a really good thing because if a plant is shorter it's not going to be as likely to blow over. It's going to have less surface area exposed to the wind for transpiration so this is, you know, it's good for plants to respond to a stimuli by stunting growth. There are some other um, thigmotropisms. One of them is to curl up. There are, you know, vine tendrils, like you can see there on the right, that they will grow out straight until they touch something. And then as soon as they touch something, one side of the plant's cells will grow very quickly. The other side will grow in the opposite direction, and it'll cause that tendril to start to curl up and grasp onto whatever is near so that it has an anchor point. And then there is another thigmotropism where leaves on the plant will actually close or flowers will close. A classic example of this is the Venus flytrap where once an insect gets inside and touches a couple trigger hairs, that thing snaps shut and, you know, it's got its prey. So just know that all of those are responses to touch, and there are many different ways that plants do respond to touch. The rest of them that we're going to talk about are environmental stresses that plants have to respond to. One of the biggest ones that we obviously, I don't know, I don't know if you think about it all the time, but it's one that's pretty common to plants is drought. Obviously, if it stops raining and plants can't get water, photosynthesis shuts down, they lose their trigger pressure, they wilt, they can't get the nutrients they need, and eventually they die. So in a drought situation, the priority is to stop water loss. And the biggest way that plants do this is through the wilting response where their leaves lose trigger pressure and go limp. 
This situation causes stomata to close. Once the stomata closes, that reduces the amount of water that is being lost by the plant. So it's one of the reasons that plants will. Yes, they will because they've lost turgor pressure, but kind of a secondary effect is that their rate of transpiration goes down. Also, some plants, when they wilt, they will curl up to reduce the surface area of their leaf. That is also a response to try to stop the loss of water. Next stress our poor plants have to deal with is the opposite, and that is flooding. Obviously, well, not obviously, actually. A lot of people forget the fact that the roots of plants don't carry out photosynthesis. They carry out cellular respiration. So that means that they need oxygen around them in order to survive. If soil is completely flooded with water and there's no air spaces, our plants can drown. So there's a couple of adaptations. Um, one of them is found in the mangrove trees. Mangroves live all their life partially submerged in water. So here's water. And the interesting thing about a, mang a mangrove tree is that they've got all of these stilt-like roots that kind of grow out in all crazy directions. Some below the waterline, some above the waterline. So in our mangrove trees, this part of the root that is above the water is an adaptation because it can get the oxygen it needs. Um, other plants have got an interesting mechanism where if the soil floods out, a signal will be sent out that causes some of the cells in the interior of the root to die off and it provides almost like a little snorkel up the root towards the ground so, the, so that the roots can get the oxygen that they need to carry out cellular respiration and to go on living. Next up for our poor plants is salt stress. If the evaporation rate in soil goes up very quickly or if something happens such that you know let's say you're in a brackish situation and a lot of salt water floods a field that's going to cause a problem for our plant because if you remember what we talked about with osmosis, if you have a cell here and you've got a bunch of salt outside of that cell, the water potential of the surrounding soil is going to be negative and water wants to move from high water potential towards low water potential. So all the water obviously is going to want to rush out of the cell and that's going to end up killing your plant. So one of the ways that plants respond to this is by increasing the concentration of solutes inside the cytoplasm, um, usually increasing the concentration of maybe sugars and starches to balance the water potential between the inside of the plant and the outside of the plant to try to stop that water loss that happens because of osmosis. Um, this also combats diffusion because if you've got a lot of salt outside but not so much solute inside, the salt is going to want to rush into your plant which will poison the plant. So if it can increase the concentration of solute in those cells, it can stop that influx of salt going in and water going out. Next up is heat stress, and this is the second to last one. Um, plants obviously have to be adapted to living in some pretty harsh, hot environments. And there's two ways that they combat this. First one is through evapotrans evaporative cooling. Sorry, I'm having a problem with words today. Um, evaporative cooling is a process seen in animals also, where as water evaporates, it takes heat energy along with it, causing a plant to cool off. Um, it's been shown that many plants, their leaves can be as much as three to 10 degrees Celsius cooler than the surrounding air just as a result of evaporative cooling. They also have got interesting little proteins in them called chaperonins. One of the problems with heat is it denatures proteins. Chaperonins kind of combat this by helping proteins to refold into their proper conformation and keeping, keeping those proteins supported while the weather is hot so that they don't denature as quickly. And the opposite of this final challenge that um, plants have to deal with is cold stress. If you have ever had a garden, you know the first freezing temperature can kill off all of your plants and that's you know a problem so there are two ways that plants combat this some species of plants they don't have the mechanisms to deal with the cold so they just don't grow where it's cold but those that do um, one of the things that they can do is increase the proportion of unsaturated lipids in their cell membrane if you remember way back when we talked about cell membranes the cell membrane is made up of a ton of these phospholipids that that look like this and there are saturated ones, unsaturated ones. One that is saturated is straight, unsaturated is kinked. Um, the ones that are saturated, when it gets cold, they pack together really tightly and they freeze and solidify, which obviously ruins the membrane of our plant. In some plants, as it gets cold, they increase the proportion of unsaturated lipids in their membranes. And because these things have got tweaks in their chains, they don't pack together and freeze very easily, so it prevents that damage to the membrane. Also, a frozen membrane can't transport things in and out very well, so this keeps fluidity so that transport can still happen. 
also scientists are discovering that several types of plants produce antifreeze compounds that actually keep the cytoplasm of the cell and the surrounding liquids from freezing. So it's like an internal antifreeze mechanism. So I know that was kind of like just a blast through a lot of random points, but group this all together into ways that plants cope with the very harsh environments that are around them. Thank you for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. I hope this was helpful to you. My name is Mr. Kite, and we'll see you again. Thank you.